Welcome to, to this edition of Welcome Change. My name is Alexandra Michans, and I lead Ashoka's work around planet and climate. And during the next 30 minutes, we will be learning from Vitze van der Werf, um, ocean lover and conservationist, about his innovations, about the new ocean treaty, and about the future of oceans in general. Hello, Vitze. Welcome. Hi there. Hi there. Thank you, Alex. Great to have you here. And so from Amsterdam, uh, Vitze is the founder of uh, the Sea Ranger Service, an organization that connects unemployed youth and Navy veterans with the urgent protection of our oceans. And Vitze has a very innovative, and I would even say practical approach um, to safeguarding oceans by building capacity in those um, that need it the most. So uh, let's get started uh, right away, Vitze, and, and maybe let's start with the basics. Um, why should everyone care about the oceans and biodiversity underwater uh, in general, including those that are not specially attracted to oceans in the first place? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Alex, for, for inviting me and giving some space to oceans. Uh, most of Ashoka Fellows work on land, as most people do. <laughs> um, however, 70% of the, the surface of our planet is water. Um, and every other breath we take uh, actually originates from the ocean. So really, it should be called planet ocean. Um, and if most of our oxygen and actually most of our food, still the largest natural food resource is the ocean. And it also is one of the big, um, you could say, change uh, uh, change in uh, in the regulation of the climate. Uh, actually, if you look at planet Earth as as an ecosystem, uh, it all starts and falls with uh, with the ocean. So the ocean is essential to life on Earth, and it's our biggest life support system that we have. So it's it's almost like a, a game changer, no? Um, when it comes to climate change uh, mitigation. Absolutely, it's it's both a game changer and there's lots of potential. But equally, it's one of the most unforgiving and challenging environments to work in. Mm -hmm. So obviously, if you want to do anything out in the ocean, uh, we often joke uh, at the Sea Ranger service that except for maybe starting an airline or going into space, doing anything on at sea or in the oceans so at a bigger, you know, in, in a professional way is very, very capital intensive and very difficult. But at the same time, once we start making changes there and we can restore biodiversity there, it can also happen on a very big scale. Mm. And they say um, the Sea Ranger Service is revolutionizing ocean conservation. Um, is that true? And if so, uh, why? Uh, <laughs> I'd like to think people people are saying that we've worked very hard for the last few years to, to make a difference in this space. Um, ocean conservation, you could argue over the next Four or five over the last four or five six decades has mostly been focused around either science or scientists going out on research ships and doing research better understanding the ocean and and how it's changing and and on the other hand NGOs that have worked to highlight the the difficulties around seeing this ocean as something that's just plentiful as something that is a resource that never runs out um, and this is kind of the problem it's it's a resource that is so over exploited that we'll start seeing the cracks. Um, so organizations like Greenpeace and, uh, and Sea Shepherd and, and all of the different NGOs have done work in terms of activism and raising awareness of, of the issues. Uh, and in different instances, governments have, have passed treaties or have changed legislation or have protected different areas at sea. Um, and this has meant that over the years, there's been some better protection uh, for the oceans. However, the big problem there is that whilst currently there are over 17,000 protected areas at sea, uh, in reality, very few of those areas have enough capacity, uh, i.e. ships and people, to be managed. Because, of course, for government, this is something very costly. So there is a danger. Uh, in fact, one could argue that the legacy we are currently leaving behind as an ocean uh, conservation movement is that that legacy is pretty much only existing on paper and that the impact on the ground and the latest research shows that out of those 17,000 areas, about 7% of the oceans protected currently, that only 0.6% have capacity to be managed. So 
you could argue that you know are we being effective as an environmental movement if if actually over 99% of what we protect on paper isn't protected in reality so with the sea range service we've kind of thought about how can you change this because if also if if bringing that capacity to sea relies on charity essentially relies on ngos raising funding it's not scalable we we're not able to really replicate this around the world so with the sea ranger service essentially what we've done is we've looked at a very almost what you could argue initially is an unconnected problem which is that youth unemployment is highest in almost every country bordering the sea in the port cities and the coastal areas so what if we were to train young people in those areas in the role of sea rangers to actually help governments manage these kind of areas and then two problems can essentially act as each other's uh, solution and your goal uh Vitsa, is to restore 1 million hectares of ocean biodiversity by 2040 is that right correct um a big part of the work is around managing marine protected areas as they're called uh however focus really should be on on restoring and repairing uh, that biodiversity in the ocean that is so far the last few decades mostly been damaged by over exploitation by destructive fisheries by uh, waste dumping um, and what's remarkable about the ocean is it has a very i would even say far quicker than on land it has the ability to regenerate itself once it's uh, you know once it's helped uh, and for example oyster re uh, reefs uh, coral reefs, um, seagrass, it's something you can plant and you can regenerate. In the Netherlands, scientists were successful in the last few years to restore 350 hectares of seagrass. And then nature decided in a single season, so just in a, in a matter of a few months, to bring that from 350 to 650 hectares. So nature just doubled this restored seagrass meadow in size. So this is the real power of nature and we just need to help it along a little bit. Fantastic. And so you you connect the dots, you work in this in these coastal areas, um, connecting these three issues, no very high young unemployment rates, lack, lack of capacity in general, no, and, and personnel to protect these marine protected areas. And then you also work with military veterans. Um, how does this multi-solving multifaceted almost approach uh, work in, in practice. Yeah, this is something in the beginning when we first kind of put forward this idea, when I first had the idea was people would push back on it. We had all these different advisors and some people who were like pro bono consultants thinking what else how we could take next steps would always say, you know, what is your core focus? Choose one thing. And that's the notion of business. You know, there always has to be a simple solution. And I don't believe that complex problems can just be fixed by simple solutions. It's just not the reality. And luckily in Ashoka, of course, we look at systems change approach. We look at, at ways that we acknowledge that actually there have to be more holistic approaches and the solutions are can also be somewhat complex if they need to be. However, as you put for, rightly, what is the practical way to implement that? So what we found is that there are a lot of very knowledgeable and skilled people leaving the military. They might have been in the Navy themselves. They have a lot of knowledge around how to train teams, how to work under pressure, how to work at sea. Uh, and everybody from the, the, the defense minister to someone on the street uh, in a port city I can talk to, everyone will love the idea that veterans support young people that need that, that help you know, and, and, and get them trained as sea rangers and ultimately after working with us for one year, they go on to other maritime jobs because we're training young people for the maritime industry, we're supporting veterans. And because we do it as a social enterprise, we're not asking anyone for a subsidy or donation. We can make this impact uh, work uh, in a financially sustainable way because we run it as a business. And even though we run it as a business, it is owned by a charity. So our business is non-profit in the sense that if we make a profit, it just goes back into our mission to support the work. So that you could argue, and that's maybe why it's revolutionary or why it's different, is that ocean conservation so far has always focused on nature, which rightly so. <laughs> but if you're trying to talk to people who aren't already connected to an ocean conservation issue about conservation, very quickly you're getting into a very complex scientific uh 
kind of language. Uh, whereas if you bring in the human element, and you're talking about young people and veterans and, and, and simply making a difference to the lives of young people, even the more conservative politicians, even establishment can easily get on board with such an approach. And I think that's what's been lacking in the, in the environmental movement, making something that is truly accessible and people can have a quick buy-in and just say, actually, that sounds great, let's do it. And not get into the discussions around fishing and restrictions and policies and and quotas and, and and the scientific mandates and all of that, which is actually really important. But I think we've had a lot of that. We just need to think about practically making the difference happen on the ground and getting ships out there to to truly protect protect the ocean. I've heard you say in the past that you don't focus that much in campaigning, but more on government, uh, on shifting government. Can you give us a bit of, of an outlook there, please? Yeah. Um... Previously, I think you used the word capacity, uh, and this is the this is a crucial notion. Actually, if we look at it very pragmatically, we just need more ships and more people out in the ocean to properly manage it, but that's very costly. So uh, we also have a shipbuilding company. We developed a special sailing ship, so that's like a very low emission. Uh, we you know the the work that normally motor ships do, we can do it with the power of wind. But this, these ships are certified as industry ships, so we can meet all the industry requirements. And that means that governments, agencies that need the capacity, uh, agencies that have the direct responsibility to manage the ocean, they can contract us. They can essentially work with us and we can support their work out at sea. Now, when we initially uh, approached the Dutch government, uh, of course, first they thought it was quite sympathetic, you know, young people on a boat doing something for nature. Um, but the social elements, I think, weighed so heavily that after uh, a year and a half of talking with the, the government, uh, four government ministers together signed the first contract. And that meant that all these underlying agencies, the question was not, will we work with the Sea Rangers? The question was, what could the Sea Rangers do for us? And that was just enough for there to be all these little pieces of work, all these little contracts, Sea Rangers would be looking at plastic pollution they would suddenly be in a fisheries area to monitor or in a protected area. We would do climate research. Uh, we would monitor in, in seaweed uh, farms offshore. So suddenly we are simply a company that, that provides this capacity and governments would hire us. And what's really unique about that is that maritime agencies and especially enforcement agencies, that's a very closed world. They don't work with outside organizations. Uh, they don't really, they're not really involved in sort of working with definitely not social entrepreneurs. Um, and out of the last five years, we ended up servicing uh, 12 government contracts. Uh, and nine of those contracts had never been contracted outside of government. It was for the first time that the government said, we're going to work with an outside organization to strengthen what we do. So as a social entrepreneur to essentially be trusted in this way uh, and to show them that it's not, it's not, you know, we're not doing commercial acquisition. We're not an NGO either. As social entrepreneurs, we can play almost like a neutral broker role. Uh, and actually it's just about implementing pragmatic uh, applications because there's not that, and that there's not that idea that either you're trying to influence some political agenda where M NGOs may do that. And on the other hand, we're not there just to make money from government like a commercial company would. So as a social entrepreneur, uh, as a social enterprise, yeah, there is, again, a really powerful position to be in to just focus on solutions that make the impact. Last March, we woke up uh, to this famous uh, sentence of the ship has reached the shore. Um, and this was celebrating uh, UN delegates reaching a historic agreement to protect marine life in, in international waters, uh, and it's called the UN High Seas Treaty. Um, and this came after 10 or even more years of, of negotiations. Um, I would love to hear your impressions of it, uh, Vidze, and, and especially how do we make sure it doesn't stay in paper? Yeah, really important agreement, groundbreaking, the High Seas Treaty. There have been some treaties in the past on oceans, but there's never been something as far-reaching uh, as this. And it's good 
to understand that you could say that you know the ocean very much like space it's like a global common which means that sort of everyone is responsible and therefore nobody really takes responsibility so the moment you go outside of the the national borders it's just like a wild west and we see this very um and perhaps if people really want to delve into this issue the outlaw ocean is a book written by a New York Times journalist, and it's also a podcast series that really goes into the what actually happens out at sea in terms of modern slavery, in terms of illegal fishing, in terms of organized crime. It's really profound. And that involves a lot of over-exploitation of resources with fishing, with oil drilling, with deep sea mining, really damaging uh, this environment. So the High Seas Treaty, you could say, for the first time, actually gets nations together, makes a lot stronger commitment um, you could say that for the first time, the standard becomes a precautionary approach. So previously, uh, licenses would be quite easily handed for certain kind of uh, economic activities out at sea, or um, you know, marine resources would be opened up with only very basic research. Whereas now, the environmental impact assessments, actually, there's a lot stricter requirements. You can't just suddenly go out to sea and do something. And because it's at a UN level and, and nations have really, you know, this is a binding treaty that actually means that, um, yeah, that it, it really should limit this unchecked kind of exp over exploitation. At the same time, as you rightly say so, how do we ensure it's not just happening on paper? And to us, that means working with governments to really think about solutions. That means we can get ships and we can get, you know, also aircraft and satellite data and, 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 and different types of technologies also out there to basically make sure we have more eyes at sea uh, and we can properly manage what we all think you know, should be protected, which is this shared ocean that we, uh, that we have and cherish. I'm seeing um, some questions are arriving to our Q&A and this is a, a reminder also to our listeners to, to, to ask questions to, to Vitze. And we have a question also on, on the Global Plastics Treaty, um, uh, which mandated nation by nation uh, progressive limits in, in plastic productions. Is this doable? What are your reactions to this? Yeah, I, I think we all need it. Uh, we don't work on the plastics issue ourselves directly because we don't work with consumers. Uh, we, we've very much taken the niche approach to work on that implementation piece with, with governments directly, uh, but it's all necessary. Um, when I started working on this issue, the ocean issue over 10 years ago, there was very, very little attention for it. And already then we could see there was, there were huge problems, you know, when even, uh, an unborn baby is found, the researchers and the doctor found that actually small plastics are digested by unborn babies. That's actually to name a very radical extreme example, or we see, uh, birds, uh, seagulls that actually have died and actually as their bodies are decaying, we find that the reason they're dying is because their stomachs are bursting with plastic. I mean, this is atrocious. Plastics are everywhere. So I don't want to sound naive because I think there's a huge task ahead of us, but I do think the global community is waking up and companies that actually are responsible for a lot of this pollution are really feeling the pressure to really change. Yeah, to really change. So we already see in the EU that throwaway plastics is something that you know, you can't go into a restaurant anymore over the coming years and, and find throwaway plastics. Um, but yeah, there's a long way to go. We're really doing catch up because up until 10 years ago, there was very, very little attention for this ocean issue. Um, yeah. And an inflection point uh, for you, Vitz, was in your early 20s. You were working uh, suddenly in a ship after having a violin uh, career almost, um, wh what did it teach you and, and what can it teach others at a similar age? Yeah, the, so I was lucky enough, as you said, I, I, I worked as a violin maker before. I uh, was already involved in conservation, but I did a lot of woodwork and my daily job. And I was able to join a research ship going to Antarctica. So I first worked as a ship's carpenter, again, working with wood, and then they actually needed an engineer to go on these expeditions. Um, so for a number of years, I actually went out with the ship and the Southern Ocean, Antarctica is of course, it's like the end of the world. You are in a place which is, I mean, it's absolutely, it's absolutely beautiful. And it is, 
it makes you realize how small and insignificant you are as a human <laughs> the moment you're in this environment where actually the storms we would meet out at sea would be like the size of 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 half of Europe and it would take like two weeks to cross them um because there's no landmass to break up the bad weather or you know it was just it was incredible and so you realize how insignificant you are and you are very much reliant on the team on the crew that you work with on the ship because if something happens in Antarctica it's probably one of the few places on earth where no help can get to it literally if something happens to our ship and we and that ship sinks let's say or 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 we lose someone at sea it's the end there is no way to get rescue there it's it's too remote so it really puts into sharp focus how you work together as a team so i think it first taught me the power of collaboration you know you really have to work together you are entirely reliant on each other for that ship to really work efficiently uh, for me as an engineer working in the engine room, even working the 12 to 4 shift in the middle of the night, keeping the engines running, right down to the cook, making sure everyone keeps happy, uh, and to the people on on, uh, on the watch. But so I think, yeah, that collaboration piece, I think, is, is really crucial. And secondly, it also confronts you with yourself because you are in a very hospitable environment. And actually being on a ship for weeks and weeks on end without even setting foot on land it's a very uncomfortable environment if you're in that storm and you're in that storm not for a few days but you know let's say two weeks uh that's very uncomfortable and i think i realized that putting yourself outside of the comfort zone ultimately actually i feel has always brought me far more than if i didn't and i think a lot of people maybe they're they're there is a reluctance, not necessarily reluctance, but there are some barriers to really taking the leap, you know, and joining that startup uh, or changing that, changing your career path or really, you know, taking on a project that the outcome isn't so certain of or, or jumping into a new field of training and, and just doing it, even though you don't, you know, really feel that maybe, you know, you have a talent for it. Um, like I have never studied business and I have never studied anything in conservation or so environmental science. Yet I run a big conservation business now. And it's just by doing, you know, and learning and, and really learning from other people and taking on more feedback and, and input that, yeah, that, that you can bring it forward. So I think those were the two things that really we need to collaborate and being out, out of the comfort zone ultimately will will really help you. I think that's what it taught me. Absolutely. And and what happens after that? We, we have a question here in the chat saying, um, many young people uh, are saying it's hard to be both aware of the climate disaster and also responsive and, and optimistic. Um, what are some of the sea rangers saying about their experience and their sense of efficacy and, and agency? And I'm interested more after the sea ranger service experience. Yeah. Um, so after the sea ranger service experience, I guess it's an element of the fact that they have a they've had a concrete role as in like they've done something very tangible. And I would say actually, currently, what we see is that almost all the government agencies that are responsible for implementing stricter climate legislation, that are responsible for doing the necessary climate research, they have huge staff shortages. So actually, a lot of jobs in that climate field, and I also know a number of startups working on climate solutions, doing proper research and making sure the worry you have around the climate, you can turn it into positive action. You know, like I, I, I were, I've been, an, I've been an activist, you know, years back and, 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 and you want to make a difference and you want to go out there and have your voice heard. But I think the moment you, you try to look at actual careers in conservation or in climate uh, kind of solutions, you'll find that there is huge shortage. And actually there's a lot of companies and organizations that would be really, you know, willing to support you if you are committed. So we see that our sea rangers, half of them go into the maritime industry. Uh, and that also means working with diving companies, working with other uh, research institutes, some work for government agencies, some go to the Navy. Um, but we also see some sea rangers that that have been in that role and end up with you at university. They continue their studies. You know, they take their learnings from what they've done out in the field and, and, and they continue to build on, on some kind of conservation career. And, and tell us, um about scaling we have a couple of questions to hear um tell us about your plans to scale internationally and also what were the crucial elements that helped you you know seven years ago start this idea and then take it to to this more scaling uh phase yeah so 
uh, I would say the the big enablers for us have has have really been the collaborations we've built with governments and also with the military. So you could argue that we have had very unlikely partners on our social green <laughs> kind of journey. Uh, and that's been what is considered quite a conservative side of government and politics. But because we work in the maritime industry, we work at veterans, we create jobs, and it is a social business, that has meant that that it sort of changed the narrative compared to, uh, let's say, uh, more traditional environmental organizations. Now, because the relationship with government has actually meant being contracted directly by government, it has meant that we have generated a revenue that has actually now been enough for two Dutch banks to finance us. And for example, this ship, we're now building a new ship, which is a big offshore uh, workship, a sailing vessel, and it's entirely financed by a bank. Now, I think that's really important because it validates that there is an actual working business model there. So in terms of scalability and replication, yes, it is about how do you you know, and we now work in the UK and in France and in Spain, and we're negotiating with the government and exactly the same, you could say, intrinsic motivations that made the Dutch government excited about this model. We see exactly the same triggers now. Uh, you know, we hit the same buttons for those other governments because they also have problems attracting young people. They have a problem with youth unemployment. They want to support veterans and, and have that capacity at sea. So Ashoka worked with us um, bringing in IKEA and PwC. Uh, we were part of the Ashoka Globalizer program and they helped us to develop a franchising model. Uh, so we're now scaling to these other countries, essentially seeking uh, yeah, franchisees, so other entrepreneurs who are willing to take on this model and we can train and support them and help them raise financing to implement a Sea Ranger service in their own country. And that's how we foresee this scaling. Um, but again, training more sea rangers and building more ships already we validated the model to the point where even though it's capital intensive actually having that having not just the government but also banks on board means that with a low interest long-term financing there is really a realistic prospect of scaling uh, and financing this which is really ra rare uh, in this kind of ocean conservation field absolutely um Vitze, a question that I always like to ask um, the environmental entrepreneurs uh, and, and fellows that we work with is uh, what brings you hope? Yeah, well, I think I've thought about this over the last few weeks, kind of what is my own mission really in terms of, you know, why am I doing all this? And it is about enabling the next generation to make nature and people really future proof. So it is about preparing our young people for what's to come. So it's, it's, it's giving them the, the, the practical skills, but also developing models that they can really you know, build careers in, in, in restoring and repairing the planet. So first of all, I'm very much uh, emboldened, I would say, by what I also very surprised by is the success of our work these last few years. Not surprised because we have an amazing team and everyone works hard, but surprised how the young sea rangers we work with, how they have taken that on and how they are accelerating this work. Uh, far bigger and faster than I ever could envision. And secondly, it is, you know, we partly also work with young people who have a real distance to the labor market, who have some form of disadvantage, you could say. And even seeing them thrive in this kind of environment, in this kind of role, that I also think, you know, there is a promise, you could almost say, from politics, that this transition, this transition to a more sustainable and equitable future, that it is about benefiting the most vulnerable. And actually turning that into practice and seeing how, you know, even a young person who have dealt with maybe drug abuse issues or has been homeless, the moment they feel that sense of purpose and they take pride and identity from being in that Sea Ranger outfit. And if you go on our website, you'll see a lot of, you know, proud looking young people and it just really works. So also, in a way, what it gives me hope is that I see a lot of young people who aren't traditional activists, who might not be fully aware, who don't know all the scientific facts but who realize that this is something that's right and who are seeing that their personal development can really benefit from simply being a sea ranger, being out in the field. Um, and, and yeah, involving those youth, uh, I think that has really given me hope that the next generation can do things differently and, and really accelerate the change we need to see. Thank you, uh, Vitze. Thank you for your 
your important and I would say very, very impressive work, um, not only to protect oceans, but also to protect life on, on earth. No, um, We're honored to have you in our Shoka family in, in the fellowship and to continue learning from you. Um, thank you all for joining, also for WOCA, for, for making this possible and see you again next Wednesday, Wednesday in our Welcome Change. Thank you, Vitze. Thank you so much, Alex, for your time.